All right. Part C. Early modern empires, England, Holland, and France. Last video, we looked at mercantilism and how in the 17th century, this new economic theory or worldview came into being that emphasized the role of the state of government to manage, to regulate, to restrict trade in the name of or with the goal of securing on the whole, on the balance, trade surpluses. Trade surpluses in order for money to come in, for gold and silver coin to come into the country and then remain within the country. And also on the assumption that the more gold and silver coming into the country, the more resources the state will have to you know, flex its muscle on the world stage, to act, to conduct, to uh, finance war, and a whole list, laundry list of other activities. So for this video, I want to take a look at three examples. So we've dealt with Spain. Spain is the old school, right? Conquer an area, exploit uh, you know, the mines, and, and earn money that way. England, Holland, France do not emphasize or focus on mining. They focus on trade. So let's take a look at these three early modern empires. There is the early English empire, 17th and 18th century. So, of course, for our U.S. viewers, which I presume is are the bulk of people, actually we have some uh, we have some foreign exchange students in uh, enrolled in this class. The 13 colonies, what later becomes the United States, these are most of them, with the exception of Georgia, which was founded later in the, in the 18th century. These are founded in the 17th century in our English colonies. And also, sometimes we forget that England had colonies in the Caribbean, and these are very, very wealthy colonies. Jamaica, Barbados, sugar is coming from England's colonies in the Caribbean. Tobacco is coming from Virginia, Maryland, and in, in in, in parts of North Carolina. Rice is coming from South Carolina. Timber and what were called naval stores, uh, supplies to build ships coming from New England. And so England really uh, uh, erects this uh, very profitable empire. Here was the so-called triangular trade. The triangular trade, all sorts of goods and people, enslaved persons involved in this vast trade across the Atlantic. Lots of money involved on, on, on all sides of these transactions. So the mercantilist, again, believes that trade, all, all the country's foreign trade should be managed and regulated to secure a trade surplus, but especially colonial trade. And in the case of England, Parliament passed a series of trade regu uh, regulations, regulatory acts, called the Navigation Acts. And... We won't go into, de into the detail because it can get a little complex, but in short, the Navigation Acts compelled England's American colonists to, for the most part, with some exceptions, to only buy goods from England and to only sell goods to England. So all trade must center, all colonial trade must center in uh, to and from England, with, around English merchants, and in particular, London. English merchants were given a the prominent central role in this new imperial system that the English constructed around the Atlantic Ocean. English merchants had the exclusive right to sell European goods, so continental European goods, to colonial Americans. Colonial Americans were barred, prohibited by the Navigation Acts, from buying 
goods directly from the Dutch or buying goods directly from the French. They could only buy French or Dutch goods from an English merchant who re-exported those goods to the colonists at a, at a marked up price, at a higher price. This, according to Merkelis theory, would enrich the mother country because it, it counted as another export from England, this re-export of European goods to colonial Americans. On the flip end, Americans, uh, colonial Americans, were not allowed to sell their produce, tobacco, sugar, directly to any other foreign power. They could only sell it to England. And then the English merchant had the exclusive right then to re-export American goods to Europeans. So if sugar ultimate if sugar's ultimate destination was going to be France, you know, if you were a Jamaican planner, you couldn't just sell that sugar straight to France. England had to get invo involved in the middle of things. And that sugar had to be traded to London, and then from London that sugar would go to France. And the English merchant, that London merchant, would pocket the difference between what he paid for it and then what he sold it for in France. And so the idea was that silver and gold, again, would center in England. Center in England through this favorable trade balance. So the Atlantic was central to this early English empire, but also, as I uh, noted in part A of this lecture, the English East India Company as well. And East India Company involved in you know, going around the Cape of Good Hope and then trading in various areas in India and a more limited, limited trade in China, bringing them back to London and then re-exporting those goods to various European countries. The second power is Holland or the Netherlands more generally. So the Netherlands consisted of seven semi-independent Dutch provinces in the most uh, the most powerful province was Holland. And the Netherlands, interestingly enough, as late as 1590, were a, were a possession of Spain. Spain had conquered the Netherlands and ruled over the ne Netherlands. But then the Dutch revolted against the Spanish and by the 1590s had secured de facto independence from Spain. And from the 1590s up through much of the 17th century, the Dutch embark on what historians have called the Dutch Golden Age. The Dutch go from being this, this uh, uh, dependent or dependent uh, 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 power that, um, th that was sort of just an afterthought in European affairs to becoming the most powerful country or wealthy country in Europe. Big part of this, as I noted before, was the Dutch East India Company, and here is a map of some of their, some of those routes, focusing on uh, Ceylon, which is now Sri Lanka, the Spice Islands or Indonesia, China and Japan, China and Japan, the Dutch East India Company, the most powerful corporation in the world in the 17th century. And so Dutch merchants, uh, particularly in Amsterdam, come enormously wealthy during this period. Here's a, uh, an image of Amsterdam in the 17th century. It's called the Dutch Golden Age, not only because of the thriving commerce, but also for the art. Dutch artists uh, and painters were at their peak in the 17th century. In fact, the best paintings from the 17th century are coming out of Holland. Of course, the canals along Amsterdam and, and along those Amsterdam canals, you had giant warehouses storing goods from all over the world, ready to re-export for merchants in Amsterdam to re-export those goods at a profit elsewhere in Europe. A 
lots of silver and gold going through, and the, the Dutch silver coin was called the Dalder. The Dalder. Of course, uh, again, bearing, uh, harking back to the Taller, the German Taller, the Dalder, the Dutch Dalder. Interesting uh, uh, for on some of these dalders, there's a, a, a dalder. There were inscriptions on on them, and there is God ins inscribed on one of the dalders. The Dutch were heavily Calvinist, although you see that, and you and you wonder, is uh, putting God on the on the money honoring God, or is it stating that money is your God, and no doubt for some of these merchants, it came pretty darn close to that. The Dutch earned a reputation in the 17th century as really as the most commercial people in the world. This Amsterdam Stock Exchange is a place where you could buy and sell shares in different companies. The Bank of Amsterdam is founded in the early 17th century. And the Bank of Amsterdam, of course, deposit banking, lend, uh, lending, buying and selling of bills of exchange, banknotes, becomes the most powerful bank in Europe, surpassing the Bank of uh, Venice. And so so that is, is Holland. Our third power is France. Now France was a uh, one of the top European powers as late as the early 16th century but in the second half of the 16th century France descended into uh, several decades of religious civil war and political turmoil and so France takes a really big hit near the end of the 16th century. In the early 17th century France begins to rebound a bit. And by the late 17th century, France is back 100% and has become one of the most formidable European powers. This was France's empire in the Americas. New France, which was uh, today is where Quebec is located, and Louisiana, Louisiana. And these were the result of exploratory missions, uh, expeditions conducted by certain Frenchmen, Robert de la Salle, and others who claim this territory for France. And then the French also have Saint Domingue, later Haiti, which was a very profitable sugar colony. But it was this man, Louis XIV, who really becomes a symbol of the French ascendancy and French power, French wealth, and French might. Louis XIV. Louis XIV was only five years old when he took the throne. Now, obviously, a five-year-old is, is unable to govern as king. And so he had a, a, uh, a, an advisor, a chief minister, Cardinal Mazarin, who governed in his stead during his formative years. Then Cardinal Mazarin died in 1661 when Louis was 23 years old and Louis decided not to appoint another chief prime minister in his place, but rather decided to govern, make, uh, govern as an absolute monarch, making all of the major decisions himself. He still had counselors, we'll look at one in a, in a moment. He still had counselors to, to help advise him, a small number of them, but he made the major decisions and governed, governed without any parliament and governed very effectively. So, of course, it's his most famous portrait. You look at the man uh, and, and the, this, the, the royal the regalia in, that, in this portrait. And, uh, and sometimes students will see this picture and they'll wonder about, about the leg. What's going on there with, with the leg? Why is he showing it off? It, it almost looks a bit feminine, but actually what Louis and, and others like him are doing in these type of portraits is he's showing um, himself to be somewhat athletic and agile and uh, 
uh, communicating to the whoever is observing this portrait that this is a monarch with energy and youth and vigor. Well, Louis, while governing as an absolute monarch and a very effective one at that, does have a finance minister who advises him very closely and also very effectively on all matters relating to money, to trade regulation, to mercantilism. And here he is right there. His name is Jean-Baptiste Colbert. Jean-Baptiste Colbert. And Colbert very wisely persuaded Louis that if he wanted to, for France, to really, you know, achieve the levels of power that, that Louis sought after, he's going to need, Louis's going to need money. He's going to need, you know, ways to finance those state expenditures to finance an expansion of his military and all of these different ventures. And Colbert says, I'll tell you how to do it. And, and Colbert comes up with all of these different uh, trade regulations, restrictions, especially against the Dutch. Louis was very envious of Dutch power, Dutch commercial power. And Colbert devised a system of tariffs against Dutch goods. And, and actually, uh, at one point, persuaded Louis to to go to war against the Netherlands in 1672, and France almost completely wiped out the Netherlands in 1672. The, uh, the, the Dutch actually f uh, obliterated their dikes and flooded, flooded their cities in order to, to uh, prevent the, the French from completely wiping out and taking over the Netherlands, and, and so the Dutch barely survived but France emerged on the other side of that war in 16, in the 1670s as the foremost European power. And uh, Colbert was that you know, mercantilist mastermind. He was, and, and in some ways, Colbert is, al is almost, uh, 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 it, you could equate Colbert with, with mercantilism. And the symbol of French wealth and French power, especially royal power in France, can't come up with a better symbol than Versailles. Versailles, this tremendous, magnificent palace in France where all the, the diplomats and foreign ministers would visit. And bring diplomats into the royal court and and they would witness the, the Hall of Mirrors. Back then, mirrors were very expensive, and so this is quite an impressive, it's still impressive. Uh, I've been to Versailles a few times, and it's, it's quite the sight. Love going to Versailles. It's, it's, it is one of the uh, greatest, greatest spectacles in, um, in European architecture. There's the king's bedroom, his high, royal highness's bedroom. So this symbolizes French power and might, but on a more practical level, Louis spends his money to expand the size of the military, doubled the size of the Navy, doubled the size of the army. He spent, get this, two thirds of his entire budget on war, two thirds on war. Doubled war expenditures. You're obviously gonna need a ton of money for that. He gets that money through mercantilism. He gets that money through the advice of, of Colbert. <laughs> There's Louis depicted as a almost as a a godlike godlike figure. What a man! What a man! There's a map of Europe in 1714. So anyway, three three examples of of. Mercantilist empires, empires that became quite wealthy during this during this period and, and accumulate quite a lot of gold and silver. All right, I will leave it there and I will see you next time.